Hello, my name is Jason DeMora and welcome back to By Faith Bible Studies. This is it, our final video in our series on Proverbs. It's been a fantastic time going through Proverbs, looking at wisdom, and studying what it means to have wisdom, what it means to search for wisdom. But really, as we come here, we have to ask this question. Why are we stopping now? There are 22 chapters in Proverbs we are not studying. Well, the first and most obvious reason is I do have to go to college eventually, so I cannot study all 31 chapters of Proverbs. But there's another reason. See, Proverbs 1 through 9, as Tom Patton would call it, is the pleadings of wisdom. Each chapter is a pleading of wisdom to the Son, either from the Father or, as we saw in chapter 8, wisdom herself, calling the Son to listen to wisdom, hear wisdom. And each chapter is really its own message, and you can look at the fullness of the chapter, and the whole chapter really does connect. That's why we were able to study it chapter by chapter. But Proverbs 10 through 20, 31, my apologies, the next 22 chapters, is different. This we would consider the portrait of wisdom. The portrait of wisdom, that's what Tom Patton would call it. And what he means by that is this idea that really in the next 22 chapters, you see what it means to have wisdom in a practical lens. What I mean by this is Proverbs 1 through 9 have showed us what wisdom is in the sense of fearing Yahweh, of having a humble curiosity towards wisdom, of growing in wisdom and realizing that as you grow in wisdom, you are growing in a lack of wisdom, a love for wisdom, having a treasure hunter's mindset, going after this elixir of wisdom, running away from the adulteress's door and towards wisdom. A fear of Yahweh which shows how great his love is and how unworthy you are of that love. A fear of Yahweh that causes you to want to learn more about him. The wisdom that he used to form the world and sustain the world. But on a practical level, what is wisdom? And that is the next 22 chapters. The nine chapters we have looked at is really just the tip of the iceberg. And the next 22 chapters in short one to two verse segments, as really that's what the next 22 chapters are. You can't really look at a whole chapter and study that. It's really one verse or two verses at a time. You'll see what wisdom is on a practical level, what it practically means to fear Yahweh on a day in and day out basis. And so in saying this, I encourage you to continue studying Proverbs. It's something that I hope I'm going to be able to continue doing in my life. Just a couple verses I want to show you from the next 22 chapters that I think will show what I mean by practical wisdom. Proverbs 11.4 read, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. A practical application of, Don't worry as much about riches as you do about righteousness. Proverbs 18.21 Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Same idea. Use your tongue effectively. Use your tongue wisely. Control your words. A practical application of wisdom. Proverbs 20.11 Even a child makes himself known by his acts, by whether his conduct is pure and upright. Watch how you act. Watch how you talk. And now watch how you act. And the way you act shows if you are wise or not. Proverbs 27.1 Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. This idea of not worrying too much about the future, but trusting in God's wisdom, a practical application. And Proverbs 29.11, my last example. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. This is not metaphorical. This is literally saying that a fool talks too much, and a wise man is quiet with his words and says the right words at the right time. These are practical verses that can help you in your day in and day out life. But you can't get there until you've studied Proverbs 1 through 9. If you do not have a treasure hunter's mindset, if you do not have a love for the elixir of wisdom, if you do not have a fear of the adulterous woman and a fear of Yahweh that is much greater than that fear, then the next 22 chapters will not apply to you. You won't want to study them. You won't want to learn them. And that's where Proverbs 9 comes in. It's sort of a transition from these next 22 chapters and the chapters we've been looking at. A summary of what we've been looking at and also an invitation to continue reading. So let's real quick look at what we've learned and then we'll jump in to Proverbs 9. 
Proverbs 1 through 4, we listened to wisdom and we heard what wisdom had to tell us about the greatness of wisdom. Proverbs 5 through 7, then we learned about folly and not to listen to folly. And folly was personified as the adulterous woman, focusing on that sin of adultery and sexual morality, which is really a symbol for all idolatry at the same time. And to not listen to folly, but to listen to wisdom. This was then contrasted by Proverbs 8, where wisdom speaks. And in wisdom speaking, she showed us that her beauty is out of this world, greater than the beauty of the fallen woman. Because the joys of this universe, when you enjoy the universe without enjoying God, are really not enjoyable at all. But wisdom says, enjoy the universe and enjoy the universe in wisdom so that you may enjoy God who is out of this world. Hunt for wisdom. And now this brings us to Proverbs 9. We've learned a lot about wisdom. We've learned a lot about folly. And now you must make a choice. That is what Proverbs 9 is all about. Will you choose wisdom or will you choose folly? Will you choose wisdom or will you choose folly? Let me read Proverbs 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has prepared her food. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her maidens. She calls from the tops of the heights of the city. Whoever is naive, let him turn in here. To him who lacks understanding, she says, Come eat of my food and drink of the wine I have mixed. Forsake your folly and live and proceed in the way of understanding. He who corrects a scoffer gets dishonor for himself, and he who reproves a wicked man gets insults for himself. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. (coughs) Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself, and if you scoff, you alone will bear it. The woman of folly is boisterous. She is naive and knows nothing. She sits at the doorway of her house on a seat by the high places of the city, calling to those who pass by, who are making their paths straight. Whoever is naive, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks understanding, she says, Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that are guests in the depths of Sheol. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that as we look at wisdom and folly, Lord, that we would realize that we need to make a choice, and really a choice every single day, striving for wisdom and not folly, and striving for wisdom only in your strength, because only you give us the strength to hunt after wisdom in a humble curiosity, wanting to know more about you. Amen. So, Proverbs 9 is interesting. In the first one through six verses, we have one section. This is the invitation of wisdom. And in verses 13 through 18, we have the invitation of folly. Two invitations given to this young man. Two invitations that we have learned very, very much about. We've learned about the invitation of wisdom that it leads to riches and honor and righteousness and truth and nobility that it leads to power and love of God and fear of God. And we've also seen the invitation of folly. And the invitation of folly we've looked at very much in depth. The invitation of folly is deceitful, disgusting, grotesque, yet sweet in a terrifying way. But in the middle of these two sections, we have verses 7 through 12. Verses 7 through 12 seem to not fit. They don't really make sense. Well, we're going to actually put off verses 7 through 12 for a moment. We're going to ignore verses 7 through 12, and we're going to look at it this section a little bit differently. Our first point is the options before you, or the invitations that you are receiving. The invitations you've looked at, and this is really a summary of everything we've looked at. This is verses 1 through 5, and verses 13 through 17. We're going to skip that middle section just for a moment. Let us look at the options before you. The options before you. 
Now, before I jump into the options before you, I want to make something very clear. This is something Solomon is going to make very clear in this chapter, and it is this. You are not at a fork in the road. You are not at a fork in the road. Rather, you are currently on one of these two paths. You are currently either on the path of folly or on the path of wisdom. There is no fork in the road. You are either following after folly or you are following after wisdom. It's more that as you walk down one of these roads, you are constantly given these invitations. Constantly, every time you open your mailbox, you get an invitation. One from folly and one from wisdom. And you have a choice. Which one will you take? Will you leave the path you're on and go to the other path or you stay the path you're on? And I pray that if you're on the path of wisdom, that you would stay on that path and always burn the invitation of folly. And if you're on the path of folly, I pray that you would get off that path, repent, turn around, and find the path of wisdom. But it's very clear. Choose wisely because you have already made a choice. Choose wisely because you are already currently on one of these paths. So what are the two options before you? This is really a summary of what we've looked at. The first thing we see is the audience of the caller. The audience of the caller. Verses 4 and 16, you will note, are identical. Whoever is naive, let him turn and hear. To him who lacks understanding, she says. Verse 4. And verse 16, whoever is naive, let him turn and hear. And to him who lacks understanding, she says. See, the point here is that the audience of both the foolish woman and the wise woman is the same. It is the naive. It is the young. It is those who are lacking understanding. And if you look back through the last eight chapters, you will see this theme repeated. That wisdom cries out to the naive. Wisdom cries out to those who are lacking understanding. And so does folly. But there's a difference. Because the wise, I'm sorry, the naive who listen to wisdom realize that they're naive and they want to be wise. Those who lack understanding and say that they are lacking understanding and want to change go after wisdom. But folly imitates that and says something else. And she says this, you don't need wisdom. You are already wise. You have all the wisdom you need, one who lacks understanding. And now obviously this is a paradox and not true. It is a lie, but it is the lie of the adulteress, of the foolish woman. She says to those who are naive and says, no, do not go after wisdom. Find the wisdom inside of you and let it be free. But really that wisdom inside of them is the desires of the flesh that leads to damnation. This is the audience of the caller. It is all of us. It is the naive. It is the lacking in understanding. It is the youth. It is those who want to learn or those who realize that they should learn but don't want to. And so they choose folly. Secondly, we see the nature of the caller. The nature of the caller. Wisdom we see as working. She builds her house. She hewns her pillars. She prepares her food. We see her as open, that she's on the top of the heights of the city, that she is out there. We see that she is rich. We note that she has set her table, that she has wine, that she has this house with seven pillars, which would be really a house in a nice neighborhood. It is a rich house. She has maidens that work for her. She is respectable that she sends out maidens because she can't go out herself because of this sort of high esteem, this power that she has. She is also in the light. She is in the day. We've seen this in the past chapters. She is respectable and open and light. And all of this is a contrast to the woman of folly. She is boisterous or loud. She is naive and knows nothing, meaning she falls into the same sin that she calls others to fall into. She is foolish. She is lost. And she dwells in darkness. We've seen this in chapter 7, that it is in the twilight, in the darkness, in the middle of night, that her house is open. I love verse 14, where she sits at the doorway of her house, not inside, because there's something inside so horrid, so grotesque, that she, in a sense, is trying to hide it. Now, that grotesqueness is that sweetness that we saw in Proverbs 7, but it is a sweetness caked in poison. She is in the darkness. She is loud. She is foolish. She is lost. 
wisdom has something real to offer and so she can boldly share that news. Folly has to be sneaky, has to be creative because she's lost, foolish, and so she hides the grossness of what she has to offer in darkness. So that the naive who come to her may not notice that they are following after an invitation into hell. Thirdly, we see the message of the caller. What does wisdom have to offer? And what does folly have to offer? Well, the first thing they have to offer here in this sort of imagination of these invitations that you receive day in and day out from our society and from the church and from the word of God. Either you choose the word of God or you choose society. What is being offered? Well, the first is a house. This is a house party in a sense. Well, wisdom, her house is described as being built by her. That she is a builder that she puts in effort for real things. It says nothing of that about folly. Her house is barely even described. Note the seven pillars of wisdom. Seven pillars shows this sense of perfection, of strength. She has a strong, perfect foundation. Folly, I would argue her house is probably even stolen. It's probably not even hers. And she's taking advantage of someone, stealing it from someone. There's no description here. It's not important because her house has nothing. Maybe in the darkness it looks similar to the house of the woman of wisdom, of lady wisdom, but really it is caked in destruction. And I think what the message we can see here from the house is this. Wisdom founds truth. She builds up truth. Folly twists it. Folly twists it. Takes truth and turns it into something that is not truth at all. The next thing they have to offer is food. Verses 2 and 5 mention the food of wisdom. She has prepared her food. She puts in her own effort. She has mixed her wine. And she says, come eat of my food and drink of the wine I have mixed. And do it in a sense of richness. She has also set her table. There is sort of a fine dining atmosphere here. This is good food. It's more luxurious than what the woman of folly has to offer. Because what does the woman of folly have to offer? All she has is water and bread. Nothing compared to the glories of the riches of the food of the woman of wisdom. Then why would you ever go after folly? Well, this is why. Verse 17, and I think this is such a powerful verse, and it is so terrifyingly true. Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. When something is evil, it is sweet in its own terrifying way. When you heat your food in secret and you realize you've stolen it for someone else for your own pleasures and your own desires, it has this sense, this taste of rebellion. But that taste of rebellion is not wine. It's not a steak dinner. No, rather, it reeks with a soul poverty. Bread and water. And now water compared to mixed wine is very interesting if you look at the culture and the time. Water could be infested and not clean to drink. And so they would put wine into the water so that it would, the alcoholic beverage would clean and purify the water. That's the first note that's important that the wise woman offers wine. It's sort of more pure and it is good, but it's mixed wine. And the importance of that is, first of all, mixed wine can mean two things. This adding of spices, which once again shows riches, but also that it's mixed with water. And what it means by that is it's not going to intoxicate the drinker. She's not trying to deceive. Wisdom is trying to offer luxury, not deceive. Rather, if the foolish woman even had wine, which she doesn't because she is in a soul poverty, she would use that wine to intoxicate, destroy, and cause these foolish people to make the wrong choice and to go down the wrong path. But that taste of rebellion that reeks with soul poverty is sweet to those who do not realize what they are missing out on. That wisdom is so much greater than that false wisdom in your heart. And what I think we can see from food is that wisdom offers luxurious, 
wonderful, and I'd say eternal sustenance. Wisdom offers eternal sustenance, but folly is quicker. Its joys are faster and seem sweeter. There is nowhere in the description of the food of wisdom that it's sweet, because it's probably not. Rather, it has these wonderful flavors that you almost have to take time to enjoy because it has eternal sustenance that will feed you for eternity. But the food of the woman of folly is quicker and faster. And in a moment, it seems tastier. Yet the apple has worm at the center and the meat is covered in maggots. Thirdly, we see the environment. The environment. All throughout this, we see that wisdom is in wealth. And all throughout this, especially verse 17, where it says stolen and secrecy, we see that folly is in secrecy. And what I can see from this is that wisdom wants people to know. She wants people to hear her. She's at the tops of the heights of the city crying out. And folly, in a sense, tries to hide. It does say that she's at a seat by the high place of the city. But I would imagine she's in darkness looking for those particular people that she can catch and bring into darkness, that she can trick and deceive. Wisdom wants people to know about wisdom. Folly tries to hide it. Folly tries to hide it. Now this brings us to verses 7 through 12. What is 7 through 12 about? What is 7 through 12 about? Well, as I began, it's not that you are at a fork in the road and that you're receiving these invitations now. No. You've actually already made a choice. And what 7 through 12, what Solomon is doing here, is he's analyzing your heart and causing you to analyze your heart and showing you this is the choice you've already made. By looking at two tests, you can find out, have you read Proverbs and ignored it? Or have you read Proverbs 1-9 through 9 and are on the path of wisdom? The first one is curiosity, that humble curiosity. Do you have a humble curiosity? Verses 7-9, through 9, let me read them again. He who corrects a scoffer gets dishonor for himself, and he who reproves a wicked man gets insult for himself. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will still be wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in his learning. It's very simple. It is this, is that when you correct a scoffer, they hate you, and they don't want you to correct them because they think they have all the wisdom they could ever have. But when you correct a wise man, he realizes how little wisdom he has and always wants more wisdom. He has a humble curiosity, a want to always know more about God and God's wisdom. Contrasting that, the scoffer, the wicked, the one who is not wise, the one who is lacking sense, has prideful curiosity which really is a synonym for foolish ignorance. It is this, it is how can I get more happy without embracing true happiness? How can I be more knowledgeable without listening to wisdom? They try to find joy without going to God. They try to find wisdom without going to the giver of wisdom. They try to be happy in this universe without noticing that the gifts of this universe are from one who gives true happiness. Because they want to ignore that because the foolish one wants to be himself. He wants to please himself and unlock the wisdom from his heart. This is what our society teaches. Be yourself. Don't listen to instruction that tells you to be someone else. That tells you really to be greater than yourself. To lead towards an eternal glorification. No. Be yourself. Unlock yourself. And do not listen to instruction. Do not listen to those people who say that you are a sinner. Do not listen to those people who say you are a fool. No. You are wise and be yourself. This is a lie. It is prideful curiosity. Curiosity about how far can I take my sin? 
How much can I please myself with my sin? Rather, read Proverbs 1-9 through 9 and have a humble curiosity. A curiosity that leads you to wanting to know more about God's wisdom. But if you have a prideful curiosity, then you are on the path of folly. And if you have a humble curiosity, you are on the path of wisdom. It's a simple test. Are you curious about how to please yourself? Or are you curious about how to please God by humbling yourself and experiencing His love and wisdom? We should have humble curiosity as we continually search for His wisdom. Secondly, do you have a fear of Yahweh? Do you have a fear of Yahweh? This is, takes us from 10 through 11. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years of life will be added to you. This is the essence of Proverbs. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. It's as simple as that. Do you have a fear of Yahweh? Well, what is a fear of Yahweh? Well, if you're still asking that question, then you do not have a fear of Yahweh. The fear of Yahweh is a loving relationship with Him to an extent that you realize how great His love is and how unworthy of His love towards you. But still He loves you and grants wisdom to you. It causes you to have a humble curiosity. It causes you to grow in wisdom to have a treasure hunter's mindset, to realize that verse that says, where wisdom says, I love those who love me, and I will grant wisdom and riches eternal to those who love me, who fear me. God is great, and he is worthy of fear. And following from a fear of Yahweh is this embracing of wisdom that leads to your days being multiplied and years of life being added to you and riches and honor and glory and power and wonders eternal. Embrace His wisdom. Fear Yahweh and embrace His wisdom. Have you done this? Do you have a fear of Yahweh that causes you to abhor sin and love truth, that causes you to hate deceit and love nobility? Do you have this? Then you have wisdom. Then you are on the path of wisdom. But if you do not fear Yahweh, then there is no wisdom in you. And chapter verse 12 then gives us the blatant fact. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you alone will bear it. This verse is very simple. You are responsible for your own actions. If you are on the path of folly, you will be judged for your actions. Solomon wants to make it very clear that as you come to the end of Proverbs 9, that as he tells his son, keep reading Proverbs, keep listening to wisdom, always hunt. And he says, if you have not heard this, then you're on the wrong path. You're going the wrong way and it's your fault because you did not listen. You will be responsible for your own actions. And if you scoff, you will bear it alone. You will be judged in eternal damnation if you choose yourself over God, if you choose your knowledge over His wisdom, if you choose your pleasure over His pleasure eternal. But if you are wise, then you will be granted riches and honor and glory and truth and love and wisdom and an understanding of the will of God. You're responsible for your own actions, and this means that there is great glory to the one who chooses wisdom through the power of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this verse is also very important because we've looked at verses in Proverbs that have made it very clear that God is in total control. He's sovereign, and going farther than that, He has predestined everything. And looking at those verses, it causes you to go, well, then there can be no free will. But this verse makes it very clear, there is free will. Predestination and free will are a sort of paradox, but they are both true. And it is imperative to understand that God is in total control and you are responsible for your own actions. And God does not, in a sense, he does not care if you do not understand because you're still 
responsible for your own actions. It is a paradox that only he can understand because he is outside of our understanding. But if we join in wisdom, we may have a greater understanding of what that even means, that he can be in total control, yet we are responsible for our own actions. But it is a reality. It is true. And the fool cannot run from that. If you are on the wrong path, you will be judged. And our next section makes that very clear. If we've seen the options before you, the two invitations, and now we've seen the choice you've already made, hopefully you've analyzed your own heart and seen where you are. Now let us look at the outcome that awaits you. This is verses 16, sorry, verse 6 and verse 18. Verse 6 and verse 18. It is very clear. Verse 6, forsake your folly and live and proceed in the way of understanding. Wisdom leads to life and life eternal. And verse 18, But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Folly leads to death. Wisdom leads to life. Folly leads to death. It doesn't get more simple than that. Eternity is at stake. Will you choose wisdom, or will you choose folly? See, because you must choose, for you have already chosen. You're already on one of these paths. So which path will you choose? Will you choose the path of wisdom that in Proverbs 1.33 reads, But he who listens to me shall live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. Or will you choose the path of folly? For the waywardness of the naive will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Will you choose the path of wisdom where it says in Proverbs 2 verse 21, For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. Or the path of folly. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be uprooted. Are you currently on the path of wisdom? Are you trusting in Yahweh with all your heart and not leaning on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledging Him and in this, he makes your paths straight. Are you going after wisdom and realizing that how blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding? For a prophet is better than the prophet of silver and her gain better than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire compares with her. Or are you on the path of folly? Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. For the devious are an abomination to the Lord. The curse of Yahweh is on the house of the wicked. Jumping forward to verse 34 of chapter 3. Though he scoffs at the scoffers. And verse 35. Fools display dishonor. All throughout these first three chapters we see the path of wisdom and the path of folly. And it continues, the path of wisdom is defined by chapter 4, verse 9. She will place on your head a garland of grace. She will present you with a crown of beauty. And verse 18, but the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Or will you choose the path of folly? The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. Which path are you on? And which will you choose? This brings us to chapter 5. The darkness of the path of folly. 5 verse 23. He will die for lack of instruction. And the greatness of his folly, he will go astray. Chapter 6 verse 15. Therefore his calamity will come suddenly. Instantly he will be broken. And there will be no healing. This is the path of folly. It leads to destruction. Chapter 7, going even darker into the path of adultery and folly and evil until an arrow pierces through his liver as a bird hastens to the snare so he does not know that it will cost him his life. Her house is the way to Sheol, descending to the chambers of death. Will you choose the path of wickedness? Or will you choose the path of righteousness? 
which is defined by this. Chapter 8, verses 6. Listen, for I will speak noble things, and the opening of my lips will reveal right things. For my mouth will utter truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the utterances of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing crooked or perverted in them. They are straightforward to him who understands, and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction and not silver, and knowledge rather than choicest gold. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all desirable things things cannot compare with her. The path of folly does not compare to this glorious path. By me kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me princes rule and nobles all who judge rightly. I love those who love me and those who diligently seek me will find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even pure gold, and my yield better than the choicest silver. I walk in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of justice to endow those who love me with wealth that I may fill their treasury. Then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was daily his delight, or God's delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. Now therefore, O sons, listen to me, for blessed are they who keep my ways. Heed instruction and be wise, and do not neglect it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my doorposts. For he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from Yahweh. Will you choose the path of wisdom or the path of folly? But he who sins against me injures himself. All those who hate me love death. Which will you choose? Which will you choose? Before we finish, we have to turn to a New Testament passage. Because I have to make one final thing very, very clear. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Last week, I talked about Jesus and this question of, is chapter 8 speaking about Jesus? And we made it very clear that chapter 8 is not speaking about Jesus. However, Jesus is the epitome of the attributes of Lady Wisdom. Obviously, Lady Wisdom is not a real person. She is the personification of an attribute of God. Jesus is God. And in 1 Corinthians, he is mentioned, God, Jesus is mentioned as the wisdom of God. And that's where some people get that idea, but it's very clear to understand. He is wisdom. He is wisdom. He is not Lady Wisdom. Yet there is something beautiful in that, and I want to jump on that, and this is so important. Because if we look at Proverbs 1-9 through 9, without going to this passage, there is a chance that we can look at everything we've just looked at and jump to self-righteousness and say that we can find wisdom on our own. And I want to make it very clear that that is not a possibility. 1 Corinthians 1, 24, we'll begin there. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. That's where that comes from. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Basically saying that if God could be foolish, which he can't, even that foolishness would be wiser than man's wisdom. And the weakness of God, even if he could be weak, would be stronger than men. God is greater. God is wiser. And the epitome of his wisdom, in a sense, is Jesus. But hear this. This is how those who are saved came to wisdom. This next section is so important. The wisdom that I just detailed, looking through chapters 1 through 8, the glorious wisdom, the invitation that you have received in the mail and you have chosen if you are on the path of wisdom was not by your strength, but by God's and God's alone. Hear this closely. For consider your calling, brethren that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. 
The reason that Jesus is called the wisdom of God is he is the only path to the wisdom of God. This is both a reminder to those who are on the path of wisdom to always remember in curious humility that God is so much greater and we cannot reach him without the righteousness, sanctification, and redemption of Jesus Christ. That we were weak and he made us strong. That we were foolish and he made us wise. That we cannot boast in ourselves. But I also think that this is an encouragement to the lacking in understanding, the naive, those who think, those who know after reading Proverbs 1-9 through 9, that they are on the path of folly. And it is this beautiful truth that we were all on the path of folly before Jesus saved. So if you are on the path of folly, call out to Jesus the wisdom of God and he will put you on the right path. He will grant you wisdom. He will make you strong, those who were weak. He will make you wise, those who were foolish. It is only by Jesus and Jesus alone. Do not read Proverbs 1-9 through and forget Jesus. Solomon did not write about Jesus because he did not know the intricacies of the beauty and grandeur of Jesus. Now that we know Jesus, we see him as this, the wisdom of God, the way that we can find the wisdom of God. It is through him and him alone. An encouragement to those who are on the path of wisdom to rejoice in him anew every morn. And an encouragement, a blessed gospel to those who are on the path of folly. We were all once on the path of folly. Find Jesus, run after wisdom, and he will grant it to you so that you may be made strong, those who are weak, and you may be made wise, those who are foolish. Jesus, the wisdom of God, choose wisely because you are currently on a path. You are not on a fork in the road. You are already currently walking towards eternal damnation or eternal life. And if you're on the path towards eternal life, Jesus will keep you. Though still be diligent hunting for wisdom. But if you are on the path of folly, there is eternal damnation at stake. Run after Jesus. Turn around, repent, and believe in him. The wisdom of God that flows from him righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that you may say, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Choose wisely, for you have already chosen. Thank you, and I'll see you next week.